And actually, there's a classical theorem which, uh, which holds for domains in Rn. It's called the Faber-Kron inequality. And it asserts that um, among all domains in Rn with a fixed volume, um, the, the round, the ball with that volume has the lowest Dirichlet eigenvalue. So that's an example of a, an extremal problem. And uh, uh, in fact, it's uniquely, the minim minimum in that case is uniquely achieved by uh, by round, uh, the round ball. So the, actually, the, if you know the Faber-Kron inequality, it's quite closely related to the isoparametric inequality. For, uh, in fact, the proof uses the isoparametric inequality in a, in a natural way. So this, actually, this inequality was originally conjectured by Lord Rayleigh in about 1890 and was proven around 1920 by, by uh, Faber and Kron. Um, and so, but if we ask this question, so I'm interested really in a more, in a geometric setting. So I'm interested not just in domains in Rn, but I'm interested in arbitrary manifolds, arbitrary metrics on a, on a, uh, on a manifold with boundary. And if we ask that question, then it, it's quite easy to see that there's no, there's no generalization of the Faber-Kron inequality uh, if you don't impose some geometric restrictions. So for example, if we take, um, if we take our manifold to be um, uh, just a two-dimensional disk, and uh, if, we take, if we take the disk to be, to be uh, a disk that wraps almost all the way around the sphere, so it leaves out just a little, a little um, uh, neighborhood of, say, the South Pole, then, then that, the metric on that disk will have lambda 1 very close to 0. So when you, when you, when you shrink the the, when you shrink the disk so it covers the whole sphere, the, the lowest eigenvalue will converge to zero. On the other hand, the area is fixed, so there's, there's not going to be uh, any lower bound in general if we don't, if we don't require uh, uh, some geometric condition on the disk. So, so, so from the general point of view of the Hirsch-type prototype, the Dirichlet problem doesn't look very good. So even, even for, the, for, the, for the disk, it doesn't, uh, there won't be a minimum, uh, which, which uh, uh, which, which could occur. Um, uh, and we could ask the similar thing for the Neumann problem. So the Neumann problem is the physical problem where you allow the boundary of the vibrating drum to move freely on a frictionless uh, uh, cylinder over the boundary. So it's, it's allowed to move up and down on the boundary. And then the, uh, the corresponding boundary condition is that the normal derivative of the um, eigenfunction is zero. Uh, on the boundary, and so um, and so there is again for domains in Rn a, um, a a sharp upper bound. So so it turns out for Dirichlet eigenvalues it's natural to minimize, and for Neumann it's ma natural to maximize it's because of the the way they behave. And so uh, and so actually there's an old theorem from 1954 by Zago which says the disk maximizes mu one, which is the lowest first non-zero. Neumann eigenvalue over simply connected plane domains with a fixed area. And, and, and that result was generalized to arbitrary domains in Rn uh, a few years later by Weinberger. So again, for domains in Rn, there is a, uh, a theorem that, that, uh, that, that says that the, the, the maximal uh, geometry is, is uh, around ball. On the other hand, if we, if we pose the question for uh, metrics which are not required to be domains in Rn, then again, there, 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 is a, there is a theorem. In fact, actually, the, the Hirsch proof, the proof of the Hirsch theorem, uh, works uh, also for, um, uh, for metrics on, on the disk. So it turns out that, you, that mu1 times the area for metrics on a disk is bounded from above, and, and, uh, and then you can try to uh, construct a maximizer. But what you find is that, is that the, uh, the sharp inequality is that it's less than or equal to 8 pi, which is the same as the, uh, the, the case for the round sphere. And, and the extremal metric doesn't exist on the disk. So what, what happens is, in this case, when you take a disk that wraps almost all the way around the sphere, mu1 doesn't go to 0. It, converge, it, it goes to the lowest eigenvalue of the two-sphere, which is 2. And so, and so what happens here is what often happens, actually, in eigenvalue extremal problems in that even though your bound is sharp, it's not actually achieved by any metric on the disk. It's only achieved asymptotically as the, as the disk converges to the two-sphere and that the 
the boundary curve shrinks to zero in, in length. Okay, so, so again, even for the simplest case of the disk, the Neumann problem doesn't look so good in terms of finding extremals. And so um, it, um, it turns out there's a third eigenvalue problem which, uh, which uh, does have very interesting properties in this regard, and it's called the Steklov problem. And I want to now describe that. Um, and so um, it, it's, um, it, it's related to, um, um, so the, in general, the, the Dirichlet and Neumann eigenvalues are, are eigenvalues of the Laplace operator uh, in the domain with, with given boundary conditions. And so that operator has discrete spectrum. So for the Dirichlet and Neumann problem, it's actually related to an eigenvalue problem for an operator on, on the boundary. In other words, we consider functions on the boundary. And so the way it works is like this. Uh, if we take, a, say, a smooth function on the boundary of, of our manifold, then we can extend it uniquely inside. This called, uh, U hat, I'll denote, as the harmonic extension. So we can uniquely solve the Dirichlet problem. Uh, we look for a harmonic function inside, which agrees with U on the boundary. So actually, I should say the Dirichlet and Neumann operator is a very important operator in, a, in certain areas of applied mathematics, in, in, particularly imaging. And so, uh, and so there, there are various versions of it. But uh, I'm going to talk about it from just in this purely geometric setting. So, um, so we look at the harmonic extension, which I'll call u hat. Then the Dirichlet to Neumann uh, map is the operator that takes the function u on the boundary to the normal derivative of the harmonic extension. And so that looks like a slightly funny thing to do. But it turns out to be a, um, a very nice operator, which has discrete spectrum and uh, whose eigenvalues um, are quite interesting. Um, uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are quite interesting. So let me describe it. So for, for one thing, the operator is self-adjoint. So, so one of the key things about the Laplace operator with the Dirichlet and Neumann conditions is that it's a self-adjoint operator. And so that makes the spectrum discrete. And, and also the fact that it's elliptic makes the spectrum uh, discrete. And so. Um, um, and so here, the uh, Dirichlet and Neumann um, uh, operator is also self-adjoint. And so, so that means that if I integrate on the boundary uh, of u times lv, and then I subtract v times lu, I should get 0. And so that just follows from the divergence theorem, or what's sometimes called Green's second formula, which says that <clears throat> this is u times the normal derivative of v hat, and this is v times the normal derivative of u hat. That can be written as an interior integral of u hat Laplace and v hat minus v hat Laplace u hat, and that's zero because my functions are harmonic. Okay? And so, and so that just tells us that uh, that uh, uh, that tells us that L is a self-adjoint operator with respect to the L2 metric on the boundary. Okay? And so, uh, uh, so that's a nice property. And a second nice property is that it's it's a non-negative operator, so it doesn't have any negative spectrum, negative eigenvalues. And so the way you can see that is is if you look at u times L u then that's u times the normal derivative of u hat. That's simply the Dirichlet integral of u hat inside, again, by uh, the divergence theorem, integration by parts. And so in particular, the integral of u lu is always greater than or equal to 0. Okay? And so that makes the, uh, the spectrum, uh, the eigenvalues, all be non-negative. OK, and so um, and then there's a little bit of analysis involved. There, there's, uh, so the fact that the spectrum is discrete is related to what's called the trace embedding. So if you take a function which has finite Dirichlet integral, w12, and then um, the map, the, the restriction map for on the boundary uh, to L2 is a compact operator. And so using that, you can show that, um, that the operator, in fact, has a discrete spectrum. And I'm going to note, denote its eigenvalues by sigma for Steklov. These are Steklov. Those Steklov eigenvalues. And so uh, again, there's a, there's a trivial eigenvalue, sigma naught. That, that one's actually 0. And then the others are positive, sigma 1, sigma 2, et cetera. Uh, and there are orthonormal eigenfunctions. Uh, an eigenfunction satisfies the condition that it's harmonic inside. And on the boundary, its normal derivative is equal to, uh, is proportional to the value of the function. So the proportionality constant is the, uh, the eigenvalue. And so, and so the eigenfunctions are functions that are harmonic inside, and their normal derivatives are just a, a constant multiple times the value on the boundary. So those are the uh, eigenfunctions of the Dirichlet and Neumann map. And uh, the claim is that, uh, that there's always a, a complete orthonormal system of eigenfunctions on the boundary uh, for the, uh, the Steklov 
Steklov eigenfunctions on the boundary. So that's what the sort of general analysis <coughs> tells us for this problem. Okay, and so let me give, um, so let me point out that the eigenfunctions uh, actually also are, uh, have a variational interpretation. They're, so for Dirichlet and Neumann eigenfunctions, they're, they're critical points of uh, what's called the Rayleigh quotient, which is um, uh, the Dirichlet integral normalized or divided by the L2 norm squared on M. So the Steklov eigenfunctions have a similar variational characterization, except the denominator is the integral over the boundary of M of U squared. Okay? So it's easy to check that the critical points of this, if I take a, a, a U which is critical, it will um, uh, be a Steklov eigenfunction. It'll be harmonic inside, and, and, it, and the condition that it's critical will say that the, the uh, normal derivative is proportional to the um, function on the boundary. Okay, and so in particular, uh, there's um, a min-max characterization of the eigenvalues. The kth eigenvalue can be characterized as the minimum of the Rayleigh quotient over functions orthogonal to the first k minus one uh, eigenfunction. So in that way, you, can, it, you could variationally construct a complete orthonormal set of eigenfunctions in the same way that you can do that for the uh, Dirichlet and the Neumann problems. Okay, and the, and the eigenfunctions themselves are, are actually smooth or analytic up to the boundary, uh, which is a consequence of elliptic regularity. So the boundary condition is, a, is an elliptic boundary condition. And so it's a, it's a, it's a nice eigenvalue problem to consider. Uh, and and uh, let me give a, one example uh, and generalize it a little bit, which indicates that in some sense the, the, um, the Steklov uh, eigenvalue problem can be simpler than the, than the Dirichlet or Neumann, and that is just the case of a round ball. So if I take the, the n-dimensional unit ball, uh, the unit ball in Rn, then it turns out the, uh, uh, the eigenvalues are simply the non-negative integers, and the eigenfunctions are the homogeneous harmonic polynomials uh, of degree k. So the eigenfunction with eigenvalue k is a homogeneous harmonic polynomial of degree k. And, and that just follows because, well, the, 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 uh, the harmonic polynomials are clearly harmonic inside, and Euler's formula says that the normal derivative uh, on the unit sphere will just be the degree of the polynomial times the function on the unit sphere. So, so, uh, so these are the eigenfunctions, and they form a complete orthonormal set, so those are all of the uh, Steklov eigenfunctions. And if you've ever studied eigenvalue problems, you know that the, the, the eigenvalues of the, of the unit ball for the Dirichlet or Neumann problem are a lot more complicated than that. They're, they involve Bessel functions, the special functions, and so they're not explicitly computable. They have to be approximated. So, so, uh, so for this type of uh, uh, domain, in particular the ball, the uh, Steklov spectrum is particularly simple. And, and actually this generalizes to cone metrics. So more generally, if I took a so, so the, the unit ball, of course, is the cone over the unit sphere. More generally, if I take a closed manifold M0 and I, and I take the cone over it, it means I take the product, uh, 0, 1 cross M0, uh, and I take the metric, which is just modeling the uh, Euclidean metric in, uh, in spherical coordinates, I take dr squared plus r squared times g naught, then the Steklov spectrum, uh, the Steklov uh, uh, eigenfunctions are just homogeneous extensions of the eigenfunctions on the boundary, and the eigenvalues will be, um, will be again, the degrees of those, those extensions. So that uh, generalizes <clears throat> to the cone case. Um, okay, and now um, coming back to our extremal problems, um, it, it turns out that, that about 15 years below Hirsch, before Hirsch's theorem, there was a, um, a general theorem of a very similar type with a very similar proof, which was uh, proven about the first Steklov eigenvalue. And this, this is a theorem of uh, Weinstock from 1954. And actually, it uses the idea introduced by Zago that I mentioned earlier for Neumann eigenvalues. But the, the, the Weinstock theorem says that if I take any, so it's, so it's stated here for simply connected plane domains, but it actually works. In fact, Weinstock generalized it to arbitrary metrics on the disk. So, so you can take the disk with any metric smooth up to the boundary, and then it's true that the, uh, the lowest uh, non-zero Steklov eigenvalue times the boundary length, or the length of the boundary, is at most 2 pi. Uh, and equality is achieved for, for a disk. For domains, it's if and only if it's a disk. And so, uh, again, another way to say that is that the disk uniquely maximizes sigma 1 over 
simply connected uh, uh, over metrics on a simply connected domain with fixed boundary length. Okay? So if we fix the boundary length, then the maximum uh, sigma one is achieved by, by a disk. And um, I have a short proof of Weinstock's theorem. It's, it's actually very easy to prove. In fact, the proof is very analogous to the proof of Hirsch's theorem. So it uses the Riemann mapping theorem. So it uses a very special property of, of um, uh, simply connected surfaces, namely that they're all conformally diffeomorphic to the, to the unit disk. Okay? And so the way it works is um, uh, you consider um, a conformal diffeomorphism from M to the disk, which by the, the uniformization theorem we know uh, always exists, uh, and then we observe that uh, the, um, the conformal map is not unique. Namely, we can, we, can, we can construct other conformal maps by composing phi with an automorphism of the disk. The automorphism group of the disk is quite a large group, and uh, we can use it to balance the map. In other words, we can choose this conformal diffeomorphism to be balanced in the sense that the integral over the boundary of uh, the component functions f composed with phi is zero. So, so in other words, we can assume we've chosen a phi which is balanced. So the integral over the boundary is zero for, so phi, phi consists of phi one, phi two. So, so for each, each of the component functions integrate to zero on the boundary. And then from the variational characterization of sigma one, since the sigma zero is just the constant functions, uh, it follows that sigma one, sigma one is less than or equal to the Rayleigh quotient, and I've just moved the denominator to the left. So sigma one times the integral over the boundary of phi squared is less than or equal to the integral over m of grad phi i squared. And then when we sum it up, i equals one to two, on the left-hand side, because the map takes the, uh, the original disk, the, it takes the, the disk diffeomorphically to the unit disk, the boundary circle goes to the unit circle. And so the sum of phi i squared on the left is one, and so the left-hand side is sigma one times the length of the boundary. The right-hand side, uh, well, that's just the Dirichlet integral of a conformal or a holomorphic map in, uh, between surfaces, and that's just two times the area of the image. Well, two times the area, times the degree of the map. In this case, the degree of the map is, is, uh, is uh, one. And so we just get, this, this integral is two times the area of the image, which is, uh, uh, which is 2 pi. So, so that, that's the proof. So it's a very elegant and very simple, uh, simple argument. Um, on the other hand, it's a very special argument. It, it works only for, it works only for the, um, um, for the um, uh, unit, for the disk um, domain. And if you do a little calculation for annuli, so if you, <clears throat> if you ask is the Weinstock theorem true for annuli, uh, in other words, does, does, um, does um, <clears throat> sigma one for an annulus in the plane uh, times the boundary length, is that less than or equal to the corresponding uh, quantity for the disk? The answer is no. Uh, it's not very hard to construct annuli uh, for which the bound does not hold. In other words, you can, if you take the disk and just remove a little disk in the center and you do a little calculation, you can check that, in fact, if the central disk is small enough, the inequality is violated. So, uh, so it's not true that the disk maximizes over all domains. And so that leaves open the question, well, what, what are the maximizing metrics on, on other surfaces? So, so suppose we take a surface like an annulus or we could take some other surface with <clears throat> higher genus and um, some number of boundary components, then we can ask, um, is there a maximum for this problem? So can, can we, if we fix the boundary length, then which geometries maximize the, uh, the sigma one? And, and actually, the, the, there was never, not even a guess in the literature after, after, on this problem after 1954. But uh, my co-author, Fraser, and I figured out some, well, we figured out the structure of maximizers assuming they exist, and I'll explain that. Uh, it turns out to be a very interesting geometric uh, uh, class of surfaces. Uh, and, um, uh, and also, we, we were able to actually construct a maximizer in some cases, okay? and so I'm going to describe that uh, that work. So first of all, uh, there's a there's a, a cor uh, there's a coarse upper bound. So uh, so it, it is possible in general to show that if you fix the boundary length, or we take sigma one times l, then there is an upper bound on the um, 
eigenvalue, the normalized eigenvalue, which depends only on the topology of the surface. So, so if, you take, um, if you take surfaces with boundary, then, then the topology is determined by, by two numbers, namely the genus, that is the number of handles, and the number of boundary components. So I'm calling the genus here gamma, gamma is the genus, and K is the number of boundary components. And so, and so there are upper bounds uh, uh, of this, this form. So, so actually this upper bound was in our first paper, and then this upper bound, which doesn't depend on K, but has a slightly worse constant, was done uh, a bit later by Kokorev. And so it, but both of these use ideas which are sort of related to the Weinstock and Hirsch theorem for for the simply connected case. So it's not so hard to get, to get coarse upper bounds. The problem is that these upper bounds are uh, probably never achieved except, except in the Weinstock case, uh, although we don't know in general whether they could be achieved. Uh, but, uh, but at least there's an upper bound. So in other words, if we were trying to maximize sigma one, fixing the boundary length, we at least know that there's an upper bound. So we can hope to, uh, we could hope to uh, achieve that, that, that maximum. Okay, and so, um, and so uh, what, what, again, the um, oriented surfaces with the boundary are classified by the genus gamma and the number of boundary components k. And, and so it's equivalent, the, the surface is topologically equivalent to a closed surface with, uh, of genus gamma, that's with gamma, a sphere with gamma handles, and then minus k disks. So that's what the topology of surfaces would tell us. And then, um, and then we can ask, um, um, we can ask, given, given a, uh, a smooth surface, uh, given a smooth surface and smooth metrics on it, what's the, what's the, maximum, uh, the maximum value for sigma one times L? Or can we understand that, what that is? Okay, and so, and so we're, we're looking for ma maximizing metrics for m more general surfaces with boundary. Okay, and so this is the basic question that we ask, and if so, can we determine the metric? So what, what metric? Uh, what, what properties would the metrics have? And so, um, and so actually what we succeeded in doing is um, we did it for surfaces which are, are, um, are um, uh, things like the annulus or more generally plane domains. That is, we were, ab were able to uh, understand, we're able to construct maximizers for surfaces of genus zero. So those are topologically plane domains. The metrics are not metrics on a that are embeddable into the plane, but, but they're, they're uh, plane domains. And so uh, we were able to, in particular, understand the metric on an annulus, and it's a particular rotationally invariant annulus, which I'll describe in a little bit. And, and, and so we also were able to determine, at least asymptotically, uh, the, well, we were able to construct maximizing metrics for any plane domain that is genus zero with k boundary components, and we were able to understand the limit as k tends to infinity, the limit is, turns out to be four pi, and I'll describe a bit of that. And so the uh, idea of the proof is, is, is uh, it involves understanding the geometry of these extremals, and then there's sort of a hard analytic theorem which is, which is actually constructing the extremals. And so far we can only do that in the, uh, in the genus zero case, and I'll, I'll say a bit about that. So I first wanna talk about the structure of maximizing metrics, okay? So it's a, it's a problem, it's a variational problem. We know, we know there's an upper bound and so we can hope to, to maximize. And so the question is, suppose we could find a maximizing metric, then, then what does it look like? What what's the what's geometric property does it have? And, then, and it turns out that um, uh, the maximizing metrics are related to minimal surfaces. Uh, these are surfaces of zero mean curvature and they satisfy, so these are in, in, in a Euclidean ball and they satisfy a particular uh, boundary condition. It's called a free boundary condition. So I wanna describe that. So the main, uh, uh, th the, well, the first main theorem is that if I take a compact surface and I assume I have a metric which maximizes sigma one L, then the multiplicity of sigma one, that is the dimension of the eigenspace, is always at least two. So it has multiplicity at least two. And, and I can find a proper branched minimal immersion, we call it phi, from M into BN, uh, where n is at least two, by first eigenfunctions, uh, and on the boundary, the, the mapping is a homothety. That means it has constant derivative, so it's length. So the, if I take the pullback metric, then it's equal to, uh, it takes a constant value on the, on the boundary uh, of, the, um, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of M. 
Okay, and, and such a surface is called a free boundary minimal surface, and I'm, and I'm going to describe those here in the next few slides. And so the extremal metric then uh, is, um, is, is really a, a, up to a constant multiple, is just the induced metric on a certain class of minimal surfaces. Okay? And, so, and so that's the main theorem. Now actually the theorem, um, yeah, the proof of the theorem is a little, um, it, it, it's not, very hard, but it, it, it's analogous to a corresponding theorem which was proven by Natarashvili for closed surfaces. So this is a, uh, an analog of the theorem for, for um, uh, surfaces with boundary. And I, I don't think I'll have time to go through the proof, but it's, 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 um, it's not a simple variational argument. It, it, it uses also a little bit of functional analysis. So it uses the han banach theorem uh, in, a, in a kind of interesting way. Um, but it, it, the, the theorem assumes that we already have a maximizing metric for the problem, and then it, it, it identifies the geometry of that, uh, that metric. Um, and so, um, so let me talk a little more about free boundary minimal surfaces. So, so the, the point is, for this problem, there's um, sort of a natural class of examples that, that one can look at. Namely, um, you can look at minimal submanifolds of the ball. So I take a, a minimal so I'm here mostly interested in surfaces, so a two-dimensional minimal surface of Bn, and we assume that it's orthogonal to the sphere at the boundary. Such a minimal surface is called a free boundary minimal surface because it arises when you look at extremals of the area where you allow the boundary, uh, the boundary surface to move along the boundary of the sphere. So what are called relative cycles. So if you take a relative cycle uh, in the ball, then the critical points of the area are precisely these free boundary minimal surfaces. So it's a, so it's a natural class variationally for minimal surfaces. And they're characterized by the condition that the coordinate functions are Steklov eigenfunctions. Okay, so in particular, the fact that the um, uh, coordinate functions are harmonic is just the minimality. So, so for a minimal surface in Rn, uh, its being minimal is equivalent to the coordinate functions being harmonic functions. Okay? The mean curvature is the Laplacian of the, uh, the coordinate functions. Um, and uh, the condition, the Steklov, uh, sorry, the, the free boundary condition, the fact that the surface meets the boundary orthogonally um, is precisely the condition that the normal derivative of the coordinate functions are just the coordinate functions themselves. So they're Steklov eigenfunctions with eigenvalue one, in fact. And so, uh, and so the, the theorem on the previous slide shows that that the surfaces which maximize this eigenvalue problem, if assuming we can find a maximum, uh, will actually be achieved by uh, up to a constant multiple by the induced metrics on free boundary minimal surfaces. Okay, and so, um, so here's a little picture. So if I think of a surface in the ball and it meets the boundary orthogonally, then the minimality condition that is h equals zero is equivalent to Laplacian, the xi's are zero. And if I take eta to be the outward unit normal, then that's just the position vector uh, x because it meets orthogonally. And uh, the free boundary condition, the orthogonality condition, is just the condition that, that when I differentiate the uh, position vector in the direction of x, which is the position vector, I reproduce the vector itself. Okay? And, so, and so these geometric properties, the fact that the surface is minimal and the fact that it meets orthogonally, exactly translate into the condition that uh, the embedding functions or the coordinate functions are first, uh, not first, but are, are Steklov eigenfunctions with eigenvalue one. Okay, and so let me give some examples. So the, the simplest example, of course, is a flat disk. So, uh, we, can, we take a disk through the origin, then it will meet the boundary orthogonally. It's, 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 um, it's totally geodesic, so it has zero, uh, uh, zero mean curvature as well. And in fact, there's an old theorem from about the middle 80s, 30 years ago or more, that says that the only simply connected free boundary minimal surface in the three ball is a flat disk. And actually recently, uh, Fraser and I extended it to all di higher dimensions also. So, so it turns out, rather surprisingly to us, that, that even in high dimensions, the only free boundary um, uh, surface that's topologically a disk is actually a flat disk. So that, so that in a way, is, tells us that there's nothing other than the flat disk uh, in the simply connected case. On the other hand, if we look at annuli, then there's an obvious example, and let me describe it. So, so if we look at um, the 
minimal surface of revolution in R3, then that's called the catenoid, and it's gotten by revolving the hyperbolic cosine curve, that's a little hard to read, but that says x equals cosh uh, z, and that's the hyperbolic cosine curve. We revolve it about the z-axis, we get a minimal surface, mean curvature zero. So that's <clears throat> one of the classical examples of um, minimal surfaces, I think, discovered by Euler. And so um, if we take, um, if we draw a tangent line to the uh, <clears throat> hyperbolic cosine curve in the uh, first quadrant, uh, then, then um, uh, there's a unique, uh, <clears throat> there's a unique ray which, uh, which is tangent to uh, the hyperbolic cosine curve. And then if we draw a circle of that radius um, uh, 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 centered at the origin, and we revolve the portion of the catenoid inside the circle, so we revolve that portion around, then we will get a, an annular surface, which is a piece of the catenoid, which meets the boundary orthogonally. Okay, and that particular piece of the catenoid is called the, uh, we'll call it the, uh, the critical catenoid. So it's the portion of the catenoid which meets the boundary sphere orthogonally. And so that's, um, that's an example of a free boundary minimal surface, which is an annulus. Okay? Whether this is the only um, free boundary minimal annulus in B3 is not known, actually. Um, well, it's the only embedded one. So there, um, but, um, but that's a, a, a non-trivial non example. And as you might guess, this turns out to be the extremal for the eigenvalue problem. So that's one of the main theorems which we'll talk about toward the end. And so uh, let me describe a few others. So, so there, there have been some other uh, surfaces constructed uh, which uh, have, uh, so there's a, a construction of Capilaeus and Lee which uh, uh, constructs arbitrarily high genus free boundary uh, uh, minimal surfaces with three boundary components. So the idea, and I don't have a blackboard here, but the idea is that you take, um, you take the, the critical catenoid, so that's a solution, and you take a disk through the origin, uh, which um, uh, is perpendicular to the axis of the catenoid. And so that gives you a free boundary solution with three boundary curves, just the three circles on the boundary, and it's immersed. That means it, ha it has a curve of self-intersection. And so what Capilaeus and Lee did is they showed that you could, you could regularize that curve by adding a lot of handles along the curve. And so you, got, you actually construct a sequence of free boundary minimal um, uh, surfaces which converge to the union of the uh, critical catenoid in the disk. So, and so for very high genus, they're able to uh, construct those. Then another example that's in our paper is uh, what we call the critical Mobius band. And so it turns out if you look at the Mobius band as uh, R cross S1 and you identify, uh, so T is the R variable and theta is the S1 variable, if you identify T theta with minus T theta plus pi, then the quotient is a Mobius band. And so there's a kind of similar, um, um, and, and so there, there's a minimal embedding of the uh, Mobius band M into R4, which we can write down explicitly. It's given by, um, it's given by harmonic functions which are in separated form. So these are, <clears throat> so cinch T cos, cos theta is a harmonic function on the, on the, um, the product, on the, the, uh, the annulus R cross uh, S1, and similarly for all of these functions. And if you normalize the constants correctly, this turns out to be a conformal map. So it's, so it's obviously harmonic, the functions are harmonic, and it turns out to be conformal. So that means the, it preserves angles. And so that makes it a minimal um, immersion, and, and it's easy to see that it's an embedding. So this gives us a, a minimal embedding of the Mobius band into R4. And then as in the case of the critical catenoid, there's a unique, we can cut it off at a unique uh, finite level so that it becomes a, uh, a free boundary solution. So there's some T naught which can be explicitly computed. In fact, it's, the, <clears throat> it's the, um, the value of T for which hyperbolic cosine T is two times hyperbolic tangent two T. And so, uh, and so then and so there's a critical piece of it which meets the boundary sphere orthogonally and then we can scale it to make the, the ball a unit ball. Um, so that's, uh, that's um, uh, another example and that turns out to be the extremal for for, uh, for the eigenvalue problem for the topology of a Mobius band. Uh, it's again another result in our paper. And so let me mention uh, just the fifth class. Actually, the, people have been constructing tons of examples lately. I think after our work, the, the uh, people got much more interested in 
free boundary minimal surfaces. And in particular, um, uh, three Chinese uh, authors, Fan Tam and Yu, uh, constructed a, uh, an infinite number of S1 invariant free boundary minimal surfaces in uh, B4. And actually, they were found by studying uh, uh, critical points or maximizers for higher Steklov eigenvalues uh, for S1 invariant metrics on the annulus. And so it turns out there's a whole sequence of them. Uh, so these, are, these all turn out to be um, um, free boundary <clears throat> uh, minimal embeddings of the annulus in B4. So there are an infinite number of them, uh, and they're just param parameterized by, the, um, um, by, uh, by an integer. Um, and so, uh, in, and I, I mentioned the cone example earlier for, for um, the Steklov eigenvalue problem. So, so cones are also very natural for minimal submanifolds. So if you take a minimal submanifold of the sphere, then the cone over it is a singular minimal submanifold of Euclidean space. In fact, they play a very important role in the regularity theory for um, minimal submanifolds. And, um, and the, the cone over a minimal submanifold of sphere is, is the, the, the part inside the unit ball is a free boundary minimal surface in the ball. And there were a bunch of examples of that also constructed with symmetry by uh, these three authors uh, in recent years. So there, there have been lots and lots of examples. And let's see, I'm going to run out of time, so let me skip this. OK, and so let me just state the main theorems. And then I want to just close uh, by making a few comments about the higher dimensional case, um, <clears throat> which is some work that we've just uh, just uh, posted uh, last week, and so um, and so. First of all, the um, we're, we want to understand the um, the uh, maximizing metric for the annulus. So the way we prove that. So so the theorem is going to be that the that the critical catenoid, uh, the induced metric on the critical catenoid, uniquely maximizes the eigenvalue problem over all metrics on an annulus. And so the way we prove that is. Um, we first have to characterize the critical catenoid. So, so we prove a theorem, which is a kind of uniqueness theorem. It says that if we have a free boundary minimal annulus in Bn, it can be in any dimension, such that the coordinate functions are first eigenfunctions. OK, so remember, for free boundary minimal surfaces, the coordinate functions are eigenfunctions with eigenvalue 1, but they may not be the first ones. There could be lower eigen, the, the, one may not be the lowest uh, eigenvalue. Uh, in general, it won't be. But if we assume that it is, that, that is that, that uh, the coordinate functions are the first eigenfunctions, and so the word first there should be highlighted, then in fact n is 3 and sigma is the critical catenoid. So we have a characterization of it as um, in terms of free boundary minimal annuli. And then once we have that, we just need to prove the existence theorem. And so there's a similar characterization for uh, the critical Mobius band. So if we, um, if we take a free boundary minimal Mobius band in Bn, if we assume the coordinate functions are first eigenfunctions, then in fact n is 4 and sigma is the critical Mobius band. So we have those characterizations of the two. Uh, <clears throat> and, then, um, and then for higher k, so if I look at so, so generally, if I take genus gamma and k boundary components, I can look at the soup over metrics of sigma 1 times L. Uh, then um, Weinstock's theorem says sigma star of 0, 1 is 2 pi. And so uh, the main theorem for annuli is that sigma 1 star for uh, genus 0 with two boundary components, so that's an annulus, uh, is that value for the critical catenoid. And so for the critical catenoid, uh, you can approximate, I mean, you can, of course, compute the value, and it's approximately 4 pi over 1.2. So, so it's a number which is bigger than 2 pi, which is the value for the disk, but less than 4 pi. And so that's the, so in particular, we, we, can, <clears throat> we can uniquely um, characterize the extremal for the annulus case. Uh, and um, for the so in general, if I take sigma star of 0 k, so that means I take genus 0 and k boundary components. So it's a surface topologically which is a disk in the plane with k minus 1 disks removed. So it's, so it's, a, it's a planar domain topologically with, with, with k boundary components. And then um, the result there uh, that we proved there is that for each k, uh, a maximizing metric exists and is achieved by a free boundary minimal embedding of a very special type. And I'll Try to 
give a rough picture of those in a minute. And, and the limit of these numbers, sigma star of 0k, it turns out all of the numbers are between 2 pi and 4 pi. They're strictly increasing, and they converge to 4 pi uh, at infinity. So, um, so the, so the, uh, <clears throat> yeah. so the, the limit as k tends to infinity is a double disk. And so, so um, this is a rough picture. Th this is a computer drawn picture which, which doesn't really have anything to do with the problem. It's just an artist's rendition. But the way I, the way I would like to think of the, the, the extremal surface for um, k very large is the following way. So, so think of taking a sphere, the round sphere, and then along the equator, punch out k small disk. So around the equator, we remove k small disk. So then we have uh, a surface of genus 0 with k boundary components, and then sort of squeeze the air out of it, so, so squeeze it down so that the disk, the, the top and the bottom uh, hemispheres become almost flat disks, and then you produce a surface that, that, that's roughly what the surface looks like. We don't know exactly, I mean, we don't have a formula for computing the surface. We only know asymptotically what the, uh, what the limit is. Namely, we prove that the surfaces exist, and as k tends to infinity, the limit is a double disk. And so, and so we expect it to be a situation where these little necks on the boundary are uniformly distributed but we don't really know that, uh, actually. We don't know that the surface has uh, a sort of k-fold rotational symmetry, which it appears to have. Um, and so, um, uh, in particular, a corollary is that for every k greater than or equal to 1, there is an embedded free boundary uh, minimal surface in B3 of genus 0 with k boundary components. So, so we, in fact, construct one which maximizes the, um, the uh, which maximizes sigma 1. Uh, with the fixed boundary. Okay, and so um, the proof involves um, uh, using, so, so there's a, so we're able to, uh, uh, to construct maximizers for any k in, in the genus zero case. And so, and so it, um, there's a fair bit of work in that. It's, a, it's sort of the hard analytic part of the paper. And, and so um, uh, I won't really have time to explain it here, but, but um, it turns out just by sort of abstract methods, uh, uh, analytic methods, geometric analytic methods, you can actually construct a maximizer for any k. A maximizing metric, you can prove it's smooth up to the boundary, and, and, uh, and, then, and then the rest of it is a matter of understanding the geometry of those, those surfaces. And so, um, so for the annulus, for example, the proof is that if I take and so we want to prove the main theorem, which I've restated here. And so the, the steps in the proof are that just abstractly there exists a metric which maximizes. And then we know from our characterization of maximizing metrics that they're achieved by free boundary minimal surfaces in the ball. And so in particular, uh, we can embed by eigenfunctions and get a, um, a, uh, a free boundary minimal immersion of the annulus in the ball by first eigenfunctions. And then we use the uniqueness theorem that I mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> which characterizes those where the coordinate functions are first eigenfunctions. And then they turn out to be also embedded. They have nice geometric properties. Um, okay, and so the limit, let, let me skip this part. Uh, so, and the Mobius band is similar to the um, uh, free boundary one. I, I wanted to get to the, um, uh, some comments about the, the very recent work. So, um, so, um, if you look at these types of problems in higher dimensions, if you look at a met metric, say, on the three-sphere, if you try to generalize Hirsch's theorem, um, you find that it doesn't work at all. I mean, the, 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 the maximizer, if you fix the volume of a metric on the three-sphere, you can construct metrics where the eigenvalue lambda 1 goes to infinity. So, so the, <clears throat> the normalized eigenvalue is simply not bounded from above at all. So, so as, a, as a geometric problem in the sense I've uh, discussed for surfaces, it's not a good problem in higher dimensions unless you restrict the metrics. So there are situations, for example, if you, if you restrict to a conformal class of metrics where there are bounds and where one could hope to do the problem. Or actually, there are also certain bounds in the Kähler case. So if you take Kähler metrics uh, in some, at least if they're algebraic, there are, there are actually bounds and you might hope to be able to characterize the uh, extremals for that. Um, however, if we just look at the simpler case of, of domains in Rn, then um, there's a result of Brock from 2001 that says that um, uh, that you can um, that, that if you 
take domains in Rn with a fixed volume, then um, uh, the maximizer of sigma 1 is achieved by a ball. So it, it's, a, it's a result similar to the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the one in two dimensions, except remember in the two dimensional case, the Weinstock theorem, uh, it, it, instead of normalizing the, the volume of the interior, we normalize the length of the boundary, the area of the boundary. And so, um, and so the, um, the, the Weinstock's theorem, which, which does it for normalizing uh, the length of the boundary, actually is a stronger theorem than this, than this uh, Brock theorem. And if you, combine, uh, if you combine Weinstock's theorem with the isoparametric inequality, you prove Brock's theorem for, for, um, for disk-type domains. And we know that, that, that um, Weinstock's theorem isn't true for other domains. It isn't true for annuli or or domains with more boundary components. And so, and so um, you can ask the question whether uh, in Rn, whether the ball might maximize um, sigma 1 over domains with a fixed boundary area, at least in some, uh, assuming some restriction on the domain. Uh, so the Weinstock type restriction would say the domain is simply connected, that is, it's diffeomorphic to the disk. And so if you ask that question, um, it turns out to be false, in, even for domains in, in Rn. So, so um, uh, it, it suggests that maybe for contractible domains or domains diffeomorphic to a ball, uh, it might be true that if I fix the boundary volume, then the ball maximizes. And that turns out not to be true. And there's a recent paper that was just posted with Fraser. So there exist domains in Rn which are diffeomorphic to the ball with and same boundary volume, but have strictly bigger sigma 1. And so, and so it's sort of interesting that for domains in Rn, um, if you fix the boundary volume, there is an upper bound on sigma 1. You can, you can prove a, an explicit upper bound, but the upper bound is not achieved by a ball. And the question of what domain might achieve that, if, if, if anyone does, is unknown. So that's not true. And so let me just close with um, uh, one other statement. So, um, so another thing we proved, which I didn't have time to talk about too, too much, but, but in the two-dimensional case, <clears throat> a key aspect of uh, our proof for more boundary components is that when you add a boundary component, that is, you, pun you, you punch a hole in the surface, you actually increase the value of sigma star. So, so, the, so it, it turns out that, that if you consider the supremum for metrics on a, on a surface with an extra boundary component, it's, all, it's strictly bigger than that for the original surface. And so you can ask the same question in higher dimensions to whether that's true, and that turns out also to be false. So we also showed that the number of boundary components doesn't make any difference, in the sense that if you take any compact Riemannian manifold with boundary, non-empty boundary, in dimension at least three, then if I take any positive epsilon, I can find a smooth subdomain with, <clears throat> with connected boundary. So initially, I may have a lot of boundary components, but I can join them all up in such a way that I don't change the the volume by much, the volume changes by at most epsilon. The boundary volume changes also by at most epsilon. And sigma 1 also changes by at most epsilon. And so this result is distinctly false in two dimensions. But, but in dimension greater than or equal to 3, it's true. And so here I have a, the last slide. I have a picture of the, uh, a, a contractible domain which has larger sigma 1 than the, uh, than the ball. Than the ball. It's, uh, and so the, the idea is, actually for both of the theorems, is to take the two boundary components. So we first of all do the calculation for an annulus. And it's, again, not hard to see. In fact, it was actually done also uh, 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 a couple of years ago by Girard and Polterovich, that if you, again, take the ball and remove a small ball in the center, then, then the sigma 1 for that domain is larger than sigma 1 for a ball with the same boundary area, same boundary volume. And so what we do is we take such an annulus where I take an outer ball, and this is supposed to be a, supposed to be a unit ball, and this is a small ball removed at the center. And then I join the boundary components by a, a tube. So I think of a, a curve joining them, and I thicken it a little bit. And then I smooth out the edges. And, uh, and then <clears throat> it turns out that when you do that in dimension bigger than or equal to 3, you don't change any of the three quantities, volume, the, the uh, boundary volume or the sigma 1 by very much. You, you, you keep them all within epsilon of each other. And so that, that's the basic uh, kind of example. So the, the existence results that, we, that I described are distinctly two-dimensional. Um, 
And so uh, I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop there.